Tottenham in North London on a quiet Sunday in May. It's time to go to church for Douglas Mullings and his family. The 32-year-old carpenter notices someone has bumped his car. This leads to an argument with the local street gang. The encounter ends with a masked gunman blowing apart the back of Douglas's head. When Douglas was taken to hospital, it was decided quite quickly that he should be protected by armed police officers. He'd been attacked by incredibly violent people. I thought there was a very good chance that these people might wish to go to the hospital and cause him further harm in order to stop him from uh, speaking out. Normally we're a, a murder investigation team and it's very unusual for us to take on an attempted murder. That's usually the, uh, the shootings team's job. But in this instance, I think that the opinion was, which I suppose is wrong, is that uh, he's so severely injured or so critically injured that he won't survive. Hello there. I'm from Trident. Trident is an elite unit focused on black-on-black -black gun crime in London. To reassure the local community, a murder team takes the case. We're examining Meridian Walk, which is a, a walkway into this little housing estate. And by a great stroke of luck, there is um, CCTV there that we think have caught most of the incident. The tape shows a stolen gold Mercedes bumping into a parked blue Honda. Its owner, Douglas Mullins, goes up to the occupants of the Mercedes. The driver, wearing a distinctive black and white hat, confronts Mr Mullins. Well, we also have many witness statements from people who have witnessed this offence from the beginning. They have told us that the man who was arguing with Douglas is called Sykes. This is Douglas here with the green top and the blue trousers. He's come up and he's talking, and Sykes straight away is straight up close to him, saying, well, you know, what's wrong, man? You know, he's just driven his car into his and it's not his fault. Douglas has stood up to him and said, hang on a second, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to pay for my car? And Natalie, his daughter, has witnessed this all happening. They felt that there were big men around Meridian and how dare we ask them what happened to my mum's car. My mum was just trying to get to the bottom of it and that's when immediately they said, we spoke to your old man about it and we dealt with your old man and basically he's a dead man, he's a dead man. You know, there was no reasoning with them because at that, at that time they're not rational. You know, they just hyped up delinquents and they just wanted to start trouble that day and they did. You can see all the ewes just lining up around him, circling him, circling like sharks. You can feel the aggression just bubbling away. They armed themselves with blinds, with pieces of wood, with bricks, and they were just charging, you know, and we stood our ground, and that's what they didn't expect, us to stand our ground, because at the end of the day, they thought they could make us, you know, run away. Uh, Douglas has been hit by several things that have been thrown. There was um, bricks found in his house all along his corridor. Then he's got hold of a long knife, obviously because of his fear, he's then chased these people around. I believe that was the time when they made that fateful call and said, yes, we're going to sort this out our way. Sykes was seen on his mobile phone and that he's actually um, been heard to say, bring your peace. And I tried to explain to my mum that means a weapon of some sort, either a gun or a knife, and I think we better just go because this, this is not, you know, something that we're used to, let's just go. Witnesses have told us that the gunman was brought to the scene in a red rover. He's got the shotgun on his right-hand side, but he also has a black bandana covering the lower part of his face. He has run from Commercial Road to Meridian Walk and stopped outside number 57, where Jennifer and Douglas were. Douglas was just stepping into the house, and there was a gasp. <gasps> And that's all I heard, and I thought, what's that? And I turned around, and I saw somebody lean over, and something just lift up, which was a gun, and I just turned around. I just heard, chuk, chuk, bang. <laughs> Mum started a lot of crying and wailing, and, you know, our brother standing there seeing this strong man just there on the floor. What happened to my daddy? What happened to my daddy? Crying. And we're telling him to go, and he's not going, and he's just standing there like he's in shock. And then I'm trying to speak to the police to get the ambulance to come here. 
and I remember the lady saying, move away from that hysterical woman because I cannot hear what's happened. As Douglas is rushed to hospital, paramedics fight to save his life. With a hole in his skull the size of a cricket ball, they think he won't last more than an hour. His loss of blood alone should have killed him. As we took the bandage off, it was apparent that there was a lot of brain and dead matter and bone fragments coming out through a large irregular wound in the right side of Douglas's head, approximately here. And we can see that there is a gap in the bone where the bone itself is actually missing, having been blown out by the impact from the shotgun wound. And this sideways view of the skull shows little round pellets. They hit the skull somewhere around about here. Some pass through the skull, literally blowing fragments of bone outwards, and one or two passing then inside the skull, with one in particular lying right in the middle of his brain. After surgery was completed and Douglas was taken to the intensive care ward, I then met his wife for the first time. I had no choice but to tell her how serious the injury was and the fact that we had no means of knowing if he would survive from this injury. At the best, I suggested to her, she might have to accept that he might never regain consciousness and if he did, that he might be permanently paralysed down the left-hand side and unable to communicate with her. At the scene of crime, parts of Douglas's head remain on the floor. And how awful must that be, that you've got somebody at your feet if you love, obviously, who's got a hole in their head and they're bleeding to death at your feet? It illustrates more quite how bloody and how awful a shooting is, really. It's not quite a clean thing that you see on TV with nice round holes. It's this. And these are the sort of people we're trying to catch. As we've left the, um, the holes, the pellets have hit from the shotgun charge, but the tape is, you can see the holes. It would be ideal is we, we'll get the gun and try and put it back and try and match it to the actual shot that's here. Trident hopes these patterns will help identify the shotgun that was used. While the search for clues continues, the close remains cordoned off. Only residents are allowed in or out. Ironic that my neighbours and the friends that live around there said that since this has happened and it's so, so sad that they've had some peace, that people can sleep at nights and it's quiet. It took my husband to get a bullet in the head for that to happen. And I'm very angry. Some of the youths who fought with Douglas are in a local gang called the Meridian Crew. Over the last four years, they have caused trouble for all the residents, including the Mullings family. The area was nice when we moved there. It's just a particular family. And they made you know that they ran Meridian Walk. Especially late at night when people were trying to sleep, people in the, in the, the neighbours were trying to sleep, they just did not care. At 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock at night, you would see only their house would be busy. I mean, to the point where lights would be on, music would be blaring out. Pirate radio stations, um, you'd see girls running in and out of the houses, um, fights outside that involved guns, and you know, you see little children running for their lives because you, to see two grown men fight, even if it's play fighting, it's very scary. They would throw all their drug paraphernalia on the floor, so all the young kids would see either needles or foil wrappers. Um, they would sit there blatantly, you know, smoke what they were smoking in front of young children. And these young guys were supposed to be the little role models for the younger boys that were growing up. Just abuse, swearing, just had no respect. And unfortunately, they, this is what it led to. To protect them from further attacks, the Mullins family have been moved to a hotel. It's close to the hospital. Douglas is still in a critical condition. This is a part that gets really, starts to churn. <laughs> Sometimes you don't know what you're going to, what's going to, what you're going to see, basically. No change in victim condition. It's critical but stable on uh, life support. They were looking at slowly turning the machines off to see if he was self-sufficient and able to support his own uh, life support systems. So uh, at the moment, I, I don't know if they have stopped his. If he does start coming round, um, I mean. It